All right, guys. Let's get started. Before we start the class, I posted the uh, the second assignment this weekend. Have you all seen it? Uh, are there any questions about the assignment? Is the text clear? Um, if you if you do have a question, just feel free to email me or email your TA. And a deadline, as I mentioned, is going to be two weeks. Um, today we're going to start conclusion on neural networks. Uh, we're going to be carrying on for two parts. And then next week, we're going to have one session on RNNs. Uh, so I was planning to add CNNs to your second assignment, but uh, I thought first, let's have a discussion about this in two parts. And then after the second assignment, your third assignment would be a, a mix of um, CNNs and perhaps some unsupervised learning. Um, because I, I want to make sure that you all guys uh, have enough time before your uh, final to study and finish your projects for those grad students and also your third assignment. All right, let's get started. Um, so in the, in the previous four lectures, we've been talking about neural networks, right? So we've already started looking at the, the bag of, uh, let's say, AI. So uh, you've seen many of these uh, jargons all over the web, LinkedIn, uh, in news. So the AI is uh, encompassing the, the overall bag of all the sort of newer generation of uh, deep learning models. So inside that, we've been talking about so many other machine learning models, starting from perceptron and supervised learning. And when you go deep and deep into the specific models that we are talking about in this course, we, we arrived to the point that we talked about neural networks, how they are getting learned, how, they're, uh, how the feed forward and backward pass is going on. And then uh, I mentioned that the recent trend after 2012, when AlexNet paper came out, was the, the depth of number of uh, hidden units and hidden layers were increasing, keep increasing. And uh, through different modules that, uh, that they are used in, uh, in neural nets, uh, it was later know, uh, well-known for a deep learning model. So we're going to carry on that path. The other famous deep learning model that we're going to talk about today is convolutional neural networks. And we're going to see uh, what are the different modules and you know, units inside a convolutional neural network, what actually is a convolution or a convolved function, and what are the differences between a DNN and a CNN. Okay, So let's have a look at deep convolutional neural network, or CNN itself, All right? So uh, as you might think, the, their learning intrinsic, so the way their, their biases and weights are getting learned, are normally the same as the ordinary uh, neural nets, OK? However, one distinct feature of CNNs is that instead of inputting different sort of information, as vectors, those vector of inputs could be images, right? So specifically, they are, they are well suited for inputs that are coming from images. So why? We had already DNNs, deep neural networks, or neural networks. Why, in, at first, we need a CNN for that, OK? So as you, as you imagine, if you recall my second or third lecture when I was talking about uh, MNIST data set of those 10 digits, right, from 0 to 9, I was talking about how the input is getting uh, pre-processed, right? If you have a fully connected layer for which all the units are connected to each other using neurons, okay, if you want to pass an image with one of the well-known data set of CIFAR10, it has 10 classes of uh, uh, animals, like cats, cars, uh, humans, planes, so those dimensions are 32 by 32 and 3. So the tree is the depth of the image. So think about it as a grayscale. We have three channels in the image. Okay. So if you want to use a fully connected layer, at first layer, what you need to traverse as your input vector is the multiplication of all those three. Right. You're going to have uh, 32 multiply 32 multiply 3. Okay. So it's going to be 3,000 weights. Okay. So. Let's see a more um, sort of um, modernized data set, which is called ImageNet. 
So ImageNet has various image uh, size, but the way we process it uh, in, in the current models is 299, 299 by 3. So if you multiply this 3 now, instead of the 3,000, now you're going to get around 200K, right? Around 300K, actually. So you see that simply your network will be expanded very, very rapidly at first layer. And then considering all the other layers as fully connected layers, so all of them are going to get have to start processing from this, you know, large number of neurons. So the computations involved, uh, and as you knew, uh, the, the multiplication and addition at each of those layers for both feed forward and feed and backward will be um, very, very intensive. So one of the first reasons that people started to talk about CNNs was how are we going to downsample, how are we going to start from uh, parsing images from a smaller set of sort of vectors, okay? So that was the first um, reason. So let's have a look at uh, a very generic CNN, okay? So as I mentioned, the input is image, so any kind of image. You have some channels, and then instead of those fully connected layers, now you're gonna have convolutional layers. We're gonna discuss what a convolutional layer is in depth, in this class. So, in a general uh, manner, when you use a convolutional neural network, those early layers, those early convolutions, are going to gain some low level features from your images. By low level features, I'm talking about the edges, the corners, uh, how, how we're going to, depending on the way we, we crop the images uh, for the first layers and how we pre process them. So, the low level features are containing. Uh, these sort of features, you see they are sort of weight, they are low level features. The more we go into the, the last layers, the final layers, so we're going we're gonna to understand through the filters of these convolutional layers, so we're going to understand higher level features, okay? So some of the features can you, you can probably pinpoint, oh, that might be a portion of an eye, right? So there are higher level features. You might understand some of the colors, some of the, 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 the vectors that are representing those features. And normally in a generic CNN, the last layer that contains that softmax that we function, that, the, that we talked about in um, neural net, normally still people use that fully connected layer there, okay? So this FC here, so this FC layer is that fully connected uh, and the softmax, the softmax is included in that FC layer. And then finally, after that, you're going to have the classes of the data that we are trying to classify. For instance, if the class, uh, if for instance, you were trying to use CFAR10 or MNES, so you would have 10 classes here, right? So CAD, CAR, plane, and other things. So you see the difference here between a CNN and a DNN is up to this point, you're going to have convolutional layers, or let's say some filters in order to gain certain information from, a, from an image, okay? Just like before in, um, in neural net, after each of those fully connected layer, we had an activation function. Likewise here, after any convolution, right? We're going to have an activation. So we're going, to, we're going to be talking about different type of activations later on in this course as well. All right, so that's sort of a, a high-level view of a, of a CNN. All right? So let's see one of the earliest CNNs. It was in late 90s. I did well researcher, Jan LeCun. So he's uh, now the head of um, AI at Facebook. So at 1998, he, he came up with this... Um, model that uh, it was the fifth generation of the previous Lenet model, so uh, it was well known for his name. So Lenet 5 was able to process those MNES data set, those 10 classes of uh, handwritten, handwritten digits, okay? So the input was, uh, was 32 by 32, okay? So the first, this model had two convolutions, okay? And then some fully connected layers at the end, okay? Up to the point that the last one with a softmax. 
you could have output all those 10 different right classes that we were interested in. Now we're going to see here today how we're going to design and first of all how we're going to understand is CNN how we're going to map these two words together and what are the differences between the input size and each of those layers when we sort of uh, convolve each of those pixels and gain certain information about each of those pixels okay throughout the network all right so I brought this up in the first lecture as, as a motivation for our course. Uh, I was talking about before, so that's the point that AlexNet was proposed. So before AlexNet was um, proposed in 2012, the, the competition for um, ImageNet classification task, right? So normally, the previous winners at each year were having some sort of uh, CNNs, not very deep, They're, they were shallow, right? And they were handcrafted. Uh, their error rate for ImageNet, so this had a thousand classes. If you take a look at it online on Tens TensorFlow or PyPorch or Cafe, it has also one dummy class. So the average error rate for the top five classification, that means that you have five guesses, right? So after training your model, you're going to see the, you're going to receive the, the input image, and then you're going to see, was it a, that a specific breed of a dog or a cat? If not, so you lost your first accuracy. So your top one accuracy is going to be counted as one, right? One, one um, error. Just like that, you have up to five choices. So top one, top, top three, top four, and top five. And then if your guesses, your predictions were out of these top five, so it's going to be counted as one error, right, with processing the image. So the way they average this uh, in their test um, images, in the, in the class of those 50K test images, you're going to come up with that number, right? So in 2010, they were like having around 26, 27% error rate. 20, 2011 was around 25 and a half. And then out of a sudden, by... AlexNet entered the competition and outperformed the rest of the models by around 10%. So, as you know, AlexNet was the work of two grad students of uh, Jeffrey Hinton at the University of Toronto. So, we, we're going to talk about extensively about the model and the design of that in next lecture. Uh, I thought it's useful for you guys as an engineer to, to understand some of the state-of-the-art models. So next lecture, we're going to talk about those extensively. So out of a sudden, when a deep CNN came out, right, it had three convolutions. It had five, actually, convolutions, convolutional layers, and three FCs. So it could outperform the rest of the, uh, the competitions by a large, large margin, right? So out of, as of then, people have started to think, oh, now we have a good baseline to work on. And you see now the recent trend going. So uh, 2013 was the, the GoogleNet version 1. And in 14 and 15, there were other winners. 2015 was ResNet. So Google uh, Inception version 3 got second. And you see after this ResNet, we almost outperformed the human benchmark for that. I mentioned again, the, this human benchmark was the work of um, Andre Carpacci, so he, he used to be a uh, PhD student at Stanford, now he's the, the AI head at Tesla. So in the weekends, he was training himself as, as a human benchmark with some Python script and some JavaScript to learn those uh, thousands of images in ImageNet, right? Because even human cannot distinguish some of the breed of the dogs or the cats or I don't know, different type of animals, right? So he was training himself in the weekends, and then he tested himself, and that was later well known as the human benchmark. So he got 5% error rate to classify in those 1,000 classes. So you see after 2015, we outperformed the human performance, and that was the, that was the reason you see all this uh, funding coming from industry to, uh, to research, because um, technically, uh, computer vision, a trained, well-trained computer vision 
using a deep CNN can outperform human uh, performance. All right. I hope this this could be enough of motivation for you guys to to dig deeper and you know, perhaps consider a career in machine learning. All right. So let's see what are the differences between a convolutional layer, a convolution layer, and a fully connected layer. Yeah. All right. FC, a fully connected layer, you've already known it. So the layers are sort of forming a linear matrix multiplication, right? By using that operation, you can find the, using the input and the weights, you can find the output. And all the, all the neurons are fully connected, OK? So just like that, in order to compute this hidden layer, you need to have the input, right? You need to have the input at this point. You need to have the weights. So that's your input. That's your weights. And then you're going to be able to compute this hidden layer. Again, with the, with the already trained weights at this point, you're going to be able to compute the, the next hidden layer. All right? So you've already known that. Now let's see what a convolution, a convolve function, what it does. OK? So it is still a sort of a linear operation between the input and current weight, but not just uh, ex as exact as a fully connected layer. So depending on the filter size or your kernel or your layer size, so this convolution layer, we call it sometimes a filter or a kernel. Okay. Depending on the size of that and other hyperparameters then uh, we're going to get to know later, like sliding hyperparameter, the way we crop the corners at the input, this area, right? We can have, we can, using some, some form of linear combination, we're going to have the output of that pixel on our destination pixel, okay? So we're going to see different ways to do that in next slide. So basically, each neuron in a current layer con uh, concerns only a small local region because of the filter size. Now our filter size, or the convolutional layers, are not completely matching one, one to one with the, with the size of the, the previous layer. OK? All right, and the same convolution layer is used for each feature map in a current layer. So we use the same, for instance, three by three convolution here, right, for all of those weights of the layer. And we sort of swipe it through, sweeping from the left to right and going up and down in, depending on the, the size of the layer. So in this case, I was showing a, uh, a simplified version of 2D. In, in reality, it's going to be a 3D image because you have those uh, channels of the input, right? So depending on the channel, you have some depth. So you have to do that in depth as well. And also on the other side, this itself will be a three-dimensional kernel. And also, considering the fact that the fourth dimension is going to be batch size. So, um, Instead of parsing one by one, we might want to want to parse in batch size. So that's why in, in when you do with when you code in TensorFlow or Python or Cafe, you might see the fourth dimension as a batch size. But for now, let's just uh, consider a two D scale here. It's going to be easier to understand. Okay. So in order to compute this minus three here, okay, let me just get rid of this here. So in order to compute this minus 3 here is sort of a linear, we need to find a linear function that does the computation between my, my kernel right, and my input. So I'm not sure if you can see it. Perhaps you can have a look at it, have a look at your slide in Moodle. So it's, it's going to be minus 3 multiply 3 plus 0 multiply 0 plus 1 multiply 1. And then going downward, you're going to have minus 2 by 2, and so on and so forth. And then you add them together, it's going to be minus 3 here. And that's going to be only for this point. If you want to compute this point, does anyone know 
How am I going to do that? This point on top, top left. So I'm interested in computing this point. Um, say that again? Mm -hmm. Okay, that sounds good. You had something to add to it? Okay, yeah, as you see, in order to compute the one in the middle, we sort of have to just match this filter to the input size, right? Now, if I want to compute this point here, I need to just put this layer, this kernel, here, okay? Now, the issue arises is how am I going to proceed with these unknown pixels, right? And that's why when you um, play with um, NumPy in, in, in Python or even in TensorFlow, when you want to do a correlation or a convolution, you have to mention that how do you treating the corners? Are you going to put them as zero? Are you going to crop them in a way that you don't have any um, any issue with that? Or, or are you going to downsample this? Or sometimes you just duplicate the values of the corners. So say you have 2 and 2 and 3 and 1 and 0 here. Okay, So that's going to be the different ways you can uh, tackle this. Um, normally they call it valid, full, or the same. Um, we're going to see some examples later on. All right. Now, let's see some definitions here. Now, we need to understand that we need to, you know, take as input an image, right? And we need to sort of find a way to uh, find a linear combination to convolve that image. But let's see um, what a definition of cross-correlation is. Because if you take closely, take a look at that linear function closely is actually a cross correlation rather than a convolution. Okay, let's see the definition. So given an input image I and a filter size, say in we are talking about two dimension, right? K1 and K2, the width and height, the cro cross correlation would be given as that and that notion, which is the cross and circle around, right? So that's the notion of that. Normally in convolution, we mention it like this. So that's that's the notion for cross convolution. It's going to be a double sum of from m zero to k one minus one and n from zero to k two minus one, right? So you're going to have to compute this in a discrete word, because uh, many of these you know definitions are coming from the domain of signal processing when they are talking about a continuous domain, right? But here. For the sake of argument, because it's the, those uh, you know continuous spaces are outside our scope of the the course, whatever I'm talking about today is for discrete words. Okay, so you need to convolve. Uh, I'm sorry, you need to do the cross correlation using i of i plus m and j plus n, right? And multiply it to the kernel size from at the indices of m and n. So let's see an example. All right. So cross correlation historically was used to gain the similarities between one probe image and one test image. Okay. So for instance, uh, if I want to understand, given this image, given this Im very big image in pixels, I want to see what portion of this image has the highest similarity with, with this test image bottom, right? So the way we find it in uh, um, signal processing is to apply cross-correlation, right? And since you have two-dimensional image, you have to start from one corner normally here. So say the size is sort of this, you'll start from here and go in a for loop both way, pixel by pixel, so one here, one here, and then go one pixel again on the right. So you carry on working here and going downward, okay? 
later on you see that going pixel by pixel has its own hyperparameter called the slide. Okay? You might want to go in two steps, three, depending on the slides. Um, all right. So if you do the cross correlation, you want to find out that perhaps this test image has the highest um, similarity perhaps here, right? Okay. That's why if you plot the coefficients, you're going to see for all of those for all of those spaces here, right, very low coefficient, except this area, right? And in the middle of that would be the middle of this image. Okay. So using cross-correlation, you're able to find similarities between one test image uh, in, in a bigger scale image, okay? So that was the historical reason we were using cross-correlation. Now, an example in Python. So you can generate using a NumPy array, so a random initialization, a vector of 10, so you have 10 elements, and the maximum size would be up to 5. So it's going to generate you a random vector 4, 0, 2, up to 0, so the size is 10, a random vector, so this array. And then we, we define a filter, a, a filter 2 and 1, right? And then using the, the, the NumPy in Python, so NP shape, uh, the correlation, this cross correlation is called correlate, so between your two different vectors, A and F, and the mode is valid. The mode valid represents the one that I mentioned in the previous slide, so you, you, you ignore the, the corners. The output only represents those that are not in a corner. So you're going to lose one side in, in a two-dimensional way. That's why the output would be 9, okay? Because the corners are ignored. So the output would be 8, 2, 2, 5, up to 8, okay? So let's see under the hood what what does this function do? Okay, this MP correlate. So if you wanted to implement it from scratch, it was as if you are defining a result. Okay, an empty placeholder. So for i in range of length of this minus one, the length of a you had. Okay, you want to append the results to your result vector as the multiplication of a of i, f of 0, which was the first element, plus a, a of a plus 1, multiply f of 1, which was the second element. Okay? And the result would be this. So you see these two are matching. Um, the way, if you change this value to perhaps, um, it might have same and I guess full. So you might see different outputs because it's going to treat the corners in different ways. Okay? So this is the way cross-correlation works, OK? Now let's see what a convolution function works here, OK? Now, again, we're going to gener uh, generate a random vector. And we see we, we run um, MP, MP convolve, right? So you're going to see, again, with the valid one. Now the difference is. If you want to expand it and if you want to you know, implement it from scratch, now instead of 0 and 1, now you have 1 and 0. Okay? So you want to append the output of that linear, uh, com uh, linear multiplication and addition as f1 plus f0. Okay? If you formalize the convolution now rather than the correlation, so what you see here is Instead of km and m, now you're going to have k of minus m and minus m, all right? And actually, it would have been better that I showed it this way. I'll update the slides later. You can find it on Moodle, OK? So now, have you noticed the difference between a convolution and a cross correlation? Can anyone point this out? So in the previous definition for cross-correlation, we had 
those two summations from m0 to uh, k1 minus 1 and 0 k2 minus 1 the, the input image parsing by the indices of i plus m, j plus n and the kernel size m and m so that was here that was here now in convolution we're going to have the same thing our the kernel has minus m and minus n all right so does anyone know in real world if you want to visualize it what's going to be the, dif the difference between the cross correlation and convolution now instead of multiplying k of m and m you're multiplying to k minus m and minus n any ideas That's right. You're flipping your kernel. Okay. Now we were dealing with 2D data um, and 1D data actually in, in our example, but in 2D and uh, in 3D actually. So it's actually you're flipping it both vertically and horizontally. Okay. So it's a flip of kernel in general. So the difference between a convolution and a cross correlation is actually a flip of kernel. Right. I mean, you can easily uh, think about a symmetric kernel or a Gaussian distribution, and you can understand that uh, the convolution output would be the same as the cross correlation output because they are symmetric, right? The flip doesn't make any changes in the output. So, after all these um, definitions, so which function does the CNN use now, right? Isn't it called a convolutional neural net after all? Right? Why, why we were talking about the cross correlation here? We could have done that. We could have done. We could have used a, a convolution inside a CNN because that, you know, uh, that's why the name says that, right? But in practice, researchers have noticed that a convolution with a convolve function inside is actually more costly than a cross correlation. I'll give you an example in 2D that you see that flipping that kernel every time and doing the computation is not computationally efficient in um, computer architectures re related to uh, you know deep learning application. So, and as well as that, you know the job of a CNN in neural net is to learn the weights, right? So it doesn't matter what function we are using because no matter what, we're going to have one feed forward and backward pass and we're going to learn those weights inside the kernel, right? So if both of them can learn finally the classes of images, why not we use the one that has the least computation inside, okay? So historically, People uh, were using CNNs, and the name stayed as it was. But in practice, actually, a convolutional neural network is a neural net that uses cross correlation inside. All right. So I was mentioning about the difference difference uh, of computations for a convolution and, and a correlation. You see, if you use a correlation in two D, it's just as easy as one D. So you're just expanding your matrices from uh, now you have two shapes, like shape of zero, shape one, which is corresponding to the first and second um, dimension, right? But if you want to do the convolution there, now you have to flip it, because instead of processing this in order from f, now you have to first process the last one. Say it was two by two, right? This is two and two, and this is one and one, one and two, two and one. Now you have to flip it both vertically and horizontally. So instead of this order, right? Now what you're going to do is process it this way, right? So this becomes all this. First two and two, and then two and one, and one and two and one and one for the first dimension, and then again the same. So you see, this will make so many issues when you code this and you want to run it in accelerators. 
you want to uh, end up with so many cache misses and uh, uh, other issues that are you know, outside the scope of this course. All right? So historically, we were meant to use convolution. But after all, we find out that correlation works better because after all, we're going to learn the weights anyways. So why not use the one that has the uh, you know, better way of uh, computations? Questions? All right. Yeah. So, um, if if you expand this, so let's talk about um, Inception version three. Okay, one of the modern CNNs. It has ninety four convolution layers, one's FC. Okay, and each of those convolution layers has a third dimension because they have different channels. And in recent CNNs, we have a fourth dimension as the number of filters. So the, the layer one, right, the layer one of convolution, so you have one width and height, you have one depth, and also you have different number of, right, kernels. So you have, I don't know, 30 through, I'm sorry, three by three, which is three by three and width and height, and then you have three here, and then the last one is like 32. You have 32 number of 3 by 3 by 3s, okay? So for each of them, if you want to expand it the other way, you are bound to just wait so that all those computations are getting finished. Then next, next layer is going to need the output of this, right? You have to do the same thing for that. So you expand it to like 94 different convolution. You're going to have a slowdown. And nowadays, your cell phones, they have some... Um, Processing accelerators like Android's Qualcomm produces, or Huawei produces, or Apple produces. So for them, even taking out one millisecond out of your inference time, just to just see your smile faster, right? Or when you use your camera, detect people faces like one half of a second faster. It's going to be a winning card, you know, in, in, in industry, right? So people are doing whatever they can, so many different optimizations to make this process more efficient, right? Yeah. Cool. With like the filters that we're looking at right now, it's still kind of like a one to one from the input to the post convolution? No, it, it, it won't be a one to one mapping. We, we, we will see exactly uh, how we're going to map that. If it was a one to one mapping, it's going to be again a fully connected link. Okay? I'll, I'll talk about that. We're going to have a, a numerical example in the next slide. Okay. So, so now this is my input. Okay? That's my kernel. That's my filter. All right? Now they don't have the same size. You see, it's three by three. My input could be like here is uh, six by six. Okay. Now they don't map each other one to one. I want to just multiply my kernel, which is part of the same one to one mapping here from the input to my weight of the pre-trained weight that I had already at that point. So if I convolve these two, I'm going to be able to output this point here. Why? Because this one places here, this one places here, right? going to be here. If you want to find this point, your portion of image that your filter will place on, right, is going to be here. If you want to output this point, you have to put the filter one slide right, and then you're going to output here. Okay, and then you have to sweep it all over your image to one by one output in 2D, and then say you had a 3D, you would have gone in the depth as well, okay? So now let's see an example here. So, this is a very good um, sort of web page in order to understand convolution neural network. It's by the author, uh, it's, it's, it's the guy who is the, the human benchmark, so Andre Carpacci. Uh, he used to teach this course at uh, Stanford as well. So I, I, I recommend you guys all have a look at that. It's available online on GitHub and it's, uh, you know, free of use. All right, so now we have, this is our input, all right? The one in purple are my inputs. You see all the corners have been initialized with zero, right? So this is the way we are treating this model this way. So the corners are initialized with zero. 
so that we don't, ma we don't miss any of the corners. All right? So my input is in 3D, three-dimensional way. So you have width and height, and it was three-dimensional. In order to showcase it better, so we have it one, the first one here, zero, uh, the zeros dimension on the third dimension, which is the, the one that you see in front. The second one is here, right, one. And then the third one, which is the last one, is shown here, okay? So these are the third dimension of your input, okay? Zero, one, and two. Just like that, you have a three-dimensional uh, filter And the fourth dimension of the filter was the number of that filter that I was mentioning to you. So we have two filters of 3x3x3. Three by three by three. That's why you have the first filter, first dimension, first filter, second one, third one, and you had two of them. That's for the second one, okay? All right, so now let's see in real world how do we do the convolution. So in order to compute this point, and just like that, you see in the output, I have two. Uh, my third dimension of the output would be two. So I have three by three and two in the output. Because you have two different filters, right? Two different filters of three by three by three. So in order to compute the five as the first element of the first output, okay, I need to convolve this, this, and this with my filters and think about it as, as a cube you want to convolve it through a 3D image okay if you compute this and uh, add it by this add it by this you're going to find this 5 here alright I'm just going to start it and then we come back to it again So in order to compute each of those elements, I have to parse them filter by filter. And then to compute the second, third dimension of my output, I need to use my second, third filter, OK? So here, to compute this, in order to compute two, I have to slide it forward. Now, we call this padding as well as a hyperparameter. I'm sorry, the, the, the padding was the one we put zeros in the, in the corners. We call it the slide. So the slide size was one here, because after this, we move one. But if you start from zero, it's actually two. So the next one would be here to the, to the other corner to produce one there, OK? Depending on the slide, it's, it's, gonna do, it's gonna output your output, right? And the slide is sort of a designer choice. Some models, if you, if you take a look at Inception version three, in some layers the slide is one, at some layer is two. And it's just tend to be researchers, you know, when they, when they, were, they were designing the CNN, they come up with this hyperparameter optimization. And you see if you expand it in a very, very large network, you see that the optimization parameter is very, very large. So now there are some recent trends in research how we're going to optimize the hyperparameters in a CNN, right? Yep. In general, like, what does increasing the slide size do? Like if you increase the slide size, um, naturally you might lose some granularity about your output because you're passing, it's like you're lowering your definition of a resolution that you convolve, right? But on the other side, if you just make it one always, you might be end up in a very deep model and then the convergence rate might drop. So you have to consider, it's, it's sort of a trade-off, right? If you, if you had too big of a slide that really then like later on in your network, will you just like run out of other features to... Yeah, yeah. So, so tentatively also researchers, it, so these are all designers' choice. Later on, I'm going to talk about some building blocks of a CNN. So what are the uh, modules that we can use to, to compensate the way 
we designed the earlier phases, right? And there are so many options. I mean, it's, these are all numerical, you know, uh, approaches. So you can do so many things. Um, regularize this, play with this hyperparameter, and you might end up with a diff completely different output, okay? All right. So I'm just going to showcase this one one last time. So I'm going to stop on the third, so the second one here. So in order to produce the first one on my second output, which is the output on the second channel of the output, right? I have to convolve this tree with my second filter of three by three by three. All right? Was that clear? Yeah. So for after we do the convolution, we also added the bias as well, right? Yes. All right, so let's see a let's see a C level code of um, a two D convolution. Let me just uh, clarify this point that although this is called a, this this seems like a three D convolution, right? But in in practice, they call this a two D convolution. Why? Because you convolve your filter, which is three D, to your input, right? Not in three D, but in two D after two D after two D just like what you do here. In order to output both of them in 3D, right, you multiply it twice in 2D. You treat this as 2D, okay? You treat your filters as one of the, or the face of the filter and another time at the, the rear side of the filter. So it is a 3D fil it is a 3D convolution, but the way you convolve it is a 2D. So when you, when you see, um, the definition of convolutions in, in TensorFlow or PyPorch, this is a 2D convolution. In practice, people have found that a 3D convolution that just goes diagonally in 3D is not as efficient as a 2D if you want to implement it in hardware, okay? So in order to output this output, right, my filter would go, would convolve with this side of the image, right, one after another up to the point that it reaches this corner, and then you go in a full loop towards that, okay, at each step. So each step is you face with one face of the image in 2D, all right, that's why we call it a 2D convolutional multi channel. You have different channels in 3D, but the convolution itself is in 2D, all right. I was mentioning about the fourth dimension, which is a batch size, so I lift it out. That's why instead of seven loop, you have four loops. Uh, we have six loops here. Questions? All right. So in, in a C code, if you want to if you want to loop over all these dimensions, you have to start from the output depth, which is the depth of this output. So one for loop. This goes for the output left here. So this range of height width and uh, in-depth, right, are for my input channel. These are my input. And these shape of the Ws are for my weight channel, which are the kernels, the kernel size, right? So you can easily see that you have three for this and three for this, okay? And if you, if you see a seventh loop, that was why in some codes they are adding the, f the batch as well. So let's call it for number of batch. Okay, that would be the seven loop. So instead of parsing it one by one, you could have parsed it batch by batch, a batch of 100 or 50, right? So you would make it a seven looper instead of a six loop. So, um, but thankfully you don't have to write it down always because if you are using TensorFlow, PyForge, or Cafe, this have been already implemented. You just have to call it um, the, with this name, if it's a convolved name, or depending on the uh, framework you're working. So you don't have to write this every time. All right. Was this clear for everybody? Yeah. All right. So now we talk about the the, the major block in a CNN, which was a convolution which was using a cross-correlation, okay? Now let's see what are the other building blocks of a CNN, okay? 
Of course, we have convolutional layer. We call it conv. We must have activation layers. We talked about activation in neural network. We're going to see some of those here. And these are sort of new to you guys. So the pooling layers, normalization layers, you already know fully connected layers because they were all fully connected in neural net. You knew what a softmax layer are. And there are other choices that are outside the scope of the course. So we mostly talk about pooling layers and normalization layers here, OK? All right. So 2015, uh, Lafay and his collaborators at ICML, they brought up a very simple normalization, which was later known as batch norm. Okay. And it was turned out to be a very, very useful normalization after convolutional layers that could outperform the convergence rate of the other existing models. So out of Nover, this batch norm is now the state-of-the-art normalization in all the CNN. So as of 2015, you might see this PN before the activation layer and after the convolution. Let's see what that, what that means, OK? It's simply a, a difference of each of your x's from your mean divided by, by your standard deviation plus adding a small constant of epsilon to avoid a multiplication by 0, right? Because sometimes it's going gonna, it's gonna to be 0 if this one is uh, close to 0, right? So you add a small constant to avoid the, the division by 0. So using this very simple normalization for the output of your conclusion, you're going to be able to uh, you know, converge faster when you train your model. You remember when we were talking about the stochastic gradient descent? So using the loss function, we were starting sort of here, right? And we were just going left and right, left and right, up to the point that we are reaching the, the global minima, right? So that was the x star. Now using batch norm, we are normalizing, depending on the way we start, we are normalizing after each conclusion. So the direction towards the target, which was the x star, the the end of that right steep hill that we were using as stochastic gradient descent, right? In 2D, if you just match it in 2D. So we're going to reach this point faster because we are going straight to the point with that normalization. All right. <clears throat> so that was the definition of a batch norm. Um, let's talk about pooling layers. So uh, your colleague was asking about how we're going to downsample the size of the output of a convolution. So that's exactly what a pooling layer does. So when you have this 4x4 four four output, right? Considering an stride of two, so after this you're gonna you're gonna hop on two on the right and then here and then here. If you want to use a pooling layer, a pooling layer what it does, you have two different variety, two variants of pooling layer. One is max pooling, the other one is average pooling. If you if you go for, for a max pooling, this two by two small sub kernel would be treated as only one output by its max element. All right. So you downsample this from 2 by 2 to 1, OK? Just like this, you, from this, you pick the max. From this, you pick the max. From this, you pick the max. All right, so that's one. If you use a, a pooling layer in the middle of your block, CNN block, the output of this would downsample this by the size of its hyperparameter, which is 2 by 2, right? So we are making a 4 by 4 to a 2 by 2. If you go for average pooling, we average each of those elements, I mean all of them four, and then we put the average here. Okay? So these are the two different ways that a, a pooling layer uh, performs in a, in a CNN. When you use uh, TensorFlow in your assignment, you might just um, run, run into average pooling, and these are the hyperparameters that you can use. All right? All right, so. For activations, you've already known um, actually all of them in neural network. So sigmoid, hyperbolic tangent, ReLU, and exponential ReLU. So I just brought this up as a recap to what we've already been discussing 
throughout the, the semester. The sigmoid function was used mostly in uh, logistic regression, so the output was from 0 to 1. The hyperbolic tangent was from minus 1 to 1. We talked about the ReLU, which was pretty easy to, to implement, and the, the derivative of that was uh, pretty easy also to compute. And then the, the leaky ReLU, or the uh, parameterized ReLU, which is called also exponential ReLU, they have changed this to this in order to avoid the dead neurons that we talked about two lectures ago. Okay. So you've already known this. All right, so adding some of them together, a sample CNN now might look like this. So you input an input image of a car, right? Consider you have five classes, right? So the first layers are gaining, um, convolving with the image, gaining some low-level features, up to the point that the last layers are having more high-level features. Okay, so you have the first convolution, you activate the first convolution, you go, so that's your first layer, okay, conv1. So conv2 has a convolution and an activation and a pooling layer, okay, so that's your second layer. The third layer has these two again, fourth layer has the pooling, and then you have another convrelu, convrelu, and a pooling, so the five and six. And the last layer is your fully connected layer with the softmax. Okay? That's going to output, say, 78%. It's going to be a car, 20% truck, and up to the, the point of the horse, perhaps, is like 1%. All right, and you just, you, you just sort them up by their prediction accuracy, the way the softmax output this, and then you pick the first one. Okay? This is your top one prediction. If it was correct, your top one accuracy was okay, okay? If it was false, the output was a truck, so your top two accuracy was correct, and you lost the top one, all right? And you go on up to the top five. Yep. Yeah, unfortunately, um, yeah, I was talking with some of the colleagues uh, uh, in, in last year in Uh Yeah, I was I actually brought bringing this up. There's no well-defined metric to understand the sort of the robustness of the output. As long as your classes are correct, it might be considered as a correct classification, right? Uh, yeah, so in this case, the, even if you, your top five accurate, if, even if the, the answer was a ship, yeah, a horse, and your top five accuracy is correct, but it was like pretty low, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I understand. But I mean, going to ImageNet, when you have a thousand classes, this might not happen. Do you, uh, like, do they ever compare the probability? Uh, I haven't seen any paper. I mean, you can compare that, but... The standard way to compare in, in, in paper in research papers are all, only top one up to top five accuracy, or on the other side, error rate, right? If they want to compare this work to other work. Questions? All right. We've already talked about the 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 notation of um, neural net in extent, and we talked about the backprop. So I'm just gonna. Uh, skip through all these slides. Uh, we've already known that it's just a matter of different definitions. Um, how we're going to define the input as height, channels, height, width, and channels. All of them are in the R dimensional uh, in R space, right? And then you have the number of filters, number of biases. So I'm just going to pass through this quickly. So that's that's the way you you convolve, which was actually cross correlation, right, in three dimensional way. You have, so the third summation was through your depth of your channels. Consider it as like black, uh, I don't know, CYM or uh, GRB, right? And in the case that you're dealing with like MNES data set, the third dimension is always one, so you don't have that summation because all the images are in grayscale. So with one level, you can represent that um, grayscale, all right? And then... Um, I'm just going to just uh, skip 
through all these because uh, we've already talked about them in extending neural net. So these are just the, the different definition of the input filter size and the, the weight matrix connecting the, the, the neurons of the previous layer to the current layer and then the biases of the layer L. Um, that's going to be the, the input vector of the layer L. How are we going to define this? And that's going to be the output O and uh, the activation function, right? So that will complete the feed forward pass. We're going to find the error of the prediction, for instance, using this uh, square error rate, right? Your y minus uh, your predicted one raised to 2. And then in training, we are interested in minimizing the E of in, the in sample error of our omega, the omega size. The omega set consists of all the weights from the layer 1 up to L. And <clears throat> the way the back prop works, we've already discussed it in details in neural net, so I'm just going to uh, skip it for now. All right? There are two pitfalls in CNN. First of all, just like you knew before in neural net, there was the, the vanishing gradient, right? Because the, 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 the derivative of this using a sigmoid would make you stay in these two plateaus, right? And you wouldn't be able to converge. So that was the first one. We talked about it in extent in, in a stochastic gradient, and we have the same issue here. And also, using ReLU, although it was pretty easy to compute, but it would make us around, the research has shown around 40% of the neuron would be a dead neuron because they're not going to be updated at each iteration. It's going to stay zero. So these two issues, in order to uh, compensate with this, there are so many different techniques we can do. The most well-known techniques are changing your real with the parametric one, which we talk about in neural net, and also play with the regularization, right? We can regularize um, your, the way we train in order to avoid these pitfalls. So this is a very nice um, read by the same author, Andre Carpacci. Um, so feel free to have a look at it. It's going to be very helpful for you. Um, also, I'm just going to stop by the, the slide of the regularization. And I really, uh, so the next class, I'm just going to show you the, the demo of a regularization from this link. So you, you can easily understand it's, it's a very simple um, JavaScript. Depending on the, the number of neurons and the regularization, you see how we're going to classify these two red and green spaces. All right. So you're going to see by playing the number of nodes, you're going to have more fine grain feature classification. However, the downside is you're going to run into overfitting. overfitting. That's right. So either you have to just stay uh, aware that you, you, you might not overfit or underfit, but at the same time you have a good uh, you know, classification. All right, so next session I'm, I'm going to start with the demoing of this, and then we talk about a review of the state of, of the art CNN, starting from AlexNet to ResNet. Any questions? Yeah. So, so the job is to learn those weights, yeah. just like what we we do with neural nets, right? Yeah. yeah. Questions? All right, guys. So, see you on.